Hello, you scientists. How are you all doing today? Hopefully well. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about discovering Earth. But oh wait, doesn't quite look like Earth, does it? That's because we are currently on one of Jupiter's moons. But the type of technology that we're going to be using today focuses a lot on Earth, but it also goes into space, believe it or not. Um, two realms that are very little, uh, very, very little explored. All right. So as you can see, I'm using my words today. Uh, but once again, welcome to our Youth Scientist Kids Club today. Uh, joining me in the studio is James, who's going to be uh, helping and adding extra support. Though, believe it or not, a lot of the pictures and images that we're going to be seeing today are from me. Yep, me. Uh, I will be controlling it through an iPad that we're going to be using connected to our Science on a Sphere program today. Oops. There we go. All right. Uh, and then joining me also in the studio is Carrie, and she's going to be sending in all the questions or comments that you might have. Um, and if you're wondering, of course, how you can go on ahead and join us, feel free to go on ahead and text us at 562-286-1838, and we'd be happy to answer any of your questions. There we go, right down here. And of course, if you do happen to have any kind of questions and it's after the fact, uh, you are more than welcome to email us at live at lbaop.org. All right, but let's go on ahead and get started today. So our goal is to be able to look at a lot of really cool visuals. And from these visuals, our goal is to be able to extract information from them. So it's a way of observing, just like how we might be observing our world, but we're going to be observing through the lens of what these images are called, which are called data sets. Now, the other day, you went ahead and you made observations about an animal and how the animal, what it needs to survive in the behind the scenes habitat to then be able to build that habitat for the animal. So feel free to take those similar observation skill sets that you had uh, and use them today towards observing Earth and all the different Earth processes that tend to happen. All right, so are you ready? Let's go on and do this. I'm going to step off screen for a second and grab our iPad. It's, um, we're currently hooked up to James's computer right now that's showing you all these cool images. But what you'll be able to see is how I am moving all of these different data sets, which you will see right on the side right over here. So this is literally me just scrolling, picking a different data set for us to check out. So I am going to head on back and pick one of these for us. All right, so here we have up at the top all categories, but we can actually um, choose a wide variety. So we can focus on ocean stuff, like what we're seeing here, right? Or we can focus on space right over here. And there's really cool movies that you could see, um, and then also really cool images. So today we're gonna be focusing on the images, but if you are ever interested in checking this information out at home, you actually can. So James was just on it on his on his phone a little bit ago, but if you have an iPad or even a computer at home, any of these are great ways to be able to view some of our science on a sphere information. And all of this data that we are going to get a chance to see is actually from our partners with NOAA. So the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration are the ones that are bringing us most of this information. So thank you to them for all the lovely work that they have done. All right, so I'm going to put my iPad down and I'm going to join you again real quick. And here we have our Earth, right? Let's just ignore, ooh, all the fun colors. Uh, so if we have our Earth right here, and I'm actually going to step aside and I am going to rewind. Boop. I'm just going to pause it real quick. Now, what we're seeing right now is super blurry and it'll clear up uh, once I go on ahead and press start again. But first of all, if we kind of take a step back before we get into these colors and we think about our planet, right? So a lot of the things that we're going to be looking at today are from, well, basically kind of a space point of view, right? So our goal today is to be looking down into our world. So first of all, how do you think we get these images? How do we get these data sets? Hmm. What are your thoughts? Feel free to text them on in if you'd like. Now, for me, if I'm thinking space, then I'm probably thinking satellites, right? So as a matter of fact, there are many different kinds of satellites that are always going around our Earth. And from these satellites, we're able to get information, kind of like what we have here for our sea surface temperature. 
But satellites might not be the only way in which we get this information. If you think about how we might take temperature of our air on land or in the water, what do you think might be some other ways that we might be able to go about doing that? Hmm. Well, if you are thinking buoys, absolutely, right? So if you aren't familiar with buoys, these are large metal structures that are very floaty. And so these buoys move around, or they usually stay, they're anchored down in place in one part of the ocean. And these buoys, a lot of times, will have little, um, little, uh, almost like holes kind of like in them that make noises as winds pass through. And so that might be really relevant for those that might be, you know, on their boat and they are near shore. Uh, these buoys can help signal that. Buoys can be at different colors to tell you how far you out from the actual coastline. Um, alternatively, buoys are also really great at collecting information. So there are some informational buoys out there that one can help us with the wave height. So as the buoy moves up in the water and moves back down in the water, the buoy can have sensors inside of it that helps it to tell how big that wave might be. Right? So it's kind of cool that just the buoy going up and down can give us information of ocean conditions, right? How, how tall the waves are or how quickly the waves are coming, right? Is it just one big wave that comes every like five seconds? Or is it like every few seconds that we have maybe shorter waves, but a lot of them? Another way that buoys are useful is also in taking temperatures. Now we might not be able to get, you know, it might be very, um, very local in which we might get those temperatures, but maybe we're looking at one specific spot. And on that one specific spot, we want to know, like in a bay, for instance, or within, let's just say, um, yeah, within a bay, right? A very small area. They might want to know where the temperature, what the temperature might be. Maybe there's a few buoys to see, you know, very close to shore in the bay and one that's a little bit further out and tell the differences between those two. And so we can use temperature markers or thermometers, right, to be able to kind of know what the temperature is. And from that, we can get that information bounced from the satellite onto our phones um, or through email, and we can check that out to be able to get that information too. So science and technology definitely go hand in hand. But if we go on ahead and we take a look at this data set right here, I'm gonna go ahead and press play. So I'm gonna step out of the screen real quick. I'm going to unpause it. I'm going to move it around so I can move the globe right here, which is kind of fun. And I'm going to make it more Northern America focused right here. All right. So if we're looking at temperatures, what do you notice? Hmm. What colors do you see? Just start with the basics. Well, I definitely see red, a little bit of orange, some yellow. Green, blue, white, right? Uh, so do you see anywhere on here uh, that may give us an idea to what exactly these colors represent? We may already have a guess to what those colors might mean, right? Maybe red warm and blue cold. And many times we use that color scheme to be able to kind of tell, you know, what colors they are. But since we're a scientist, right, we're also having little keys. So this helps us understanding or interpreting our data that we're seeing right here is that we have in the very cold, right, it's going to be our blue. And then as we move to the red, it's going to get warmer. So as I'm going to step out and I'm going to move our globe from the Arctic and I'm going to move it a little further down. Ta -da. Now, where are we seeing the red the most? Now we're watching it going through several seasons of data right here, but where do you see it mainly hanging around? Well, if you're saying the middle, right, right over here, yeah, absolutely. And why exactly is it right in that middle? Hmm, looks like it might be wintertime. It seems like it's cooling down right now. Hmm, what do we have that's in the very middle of our Earth? Starts with an E. Equator, right? So our equator, our very middle part of our Earth, sits right here and it's able to warm up the fastest. Now, why is that? Why is it that it's warmer at the equator than, you know, either the top or the bottom of our, of our Earth? Hmm. Well, 
If you're thinking, well, it's because our Earth is a little bit tilted and the sun hits mainly on the equator, you are absolutely right, right? So most of the sun, as the sun's rays go onto the Earth, a lot of it gets, um, gets warmed up right within that equator area. So we have our warmest water there. And if I move on back and we look a little bit a little bit more up north, right? I think it kind of cut up maybe at the top. Um, but here, right, as we move away from that equator, we slowly start to get cooler and cooler water. Now, aside from the general patterns that we're seeing of warm in the middle and then the cooler as we go up, what else do you notice? Do you find that these temperatures stay in the same spot all the time? Hmm. Let me give you a minute just to make some observations. Hmm. Well, oh, whoa. That's so interesting. I don't know if you're also noticing, but as that red goes away, all of these darker blues and lighter blues start really coming down. So, thinking that all of this water, look how far down the blue goes. That's pretty cold. And then as it starts to warm up in the Northern Hemisphere, do you see how that water is really starting to creep up and get warmer? Yeah. Now, if you're not super jazzed about ocean temperature, I get it, right? You're like, yeah, that's, that's great, right? But believe it or not, it has a lot to do with what we see here off of, off of the coast, right? Whether it be California coast or the New England coast or wherever it is that you might be, these temperatures are basically the, the seasons of the oceans. And yeah, there actually are ocean seasons. So during certain times of the year, we'll see certain animals, right? And certain animals will come either near shore or visit along our coast to be able to feed on other animals. Um, or maybe they're traveling down to have babies, right? In a different area and they're migrating down. So the temperature of the ocean tells us a lot about what kind of animals that we'll be seeing. Ah, Valeria says hello and hopes we are having a great day. Thank you, Valeria. I hope you're having a great day as well. I know I for sure am because we're talking about one of my favorite planets, Earth. I may be biased though. <laughs> All right, so here we have our temperature, right? Now let's check out the Southern Hemisphere because I like all of Earth. And let's see if we notice a similar pattern. Hmm. Let's see. So it looks like it's really dark red back up in our equator. Now this green, whoa, how's that dark red it's swirling, right? I noticed that this green band is starting to get bigger. Parts of it are turning yellow. And that red is actually going even further down in South America. Wow, isn't that interesting? And now we're seeing the light blue kind of creep up. So it's really interesting to be able to see how the temperature can change depending upon what your coastline is like and what is on there. Ah, so we had a question of why does the Atlantic have more red higher up than the Pacific? That is an awesome observation. I'm going to go on ahead and move us back up to our Northern America portion and let's check that out, that observation, and then we can chat about that. All right, so here we go. Now, if we go on ahead and we look, right, um, at our, our eastern seaboard right here, uh, we can kind of see that it definitely is starting to get redder and redder as it goes up. Now, it's kind of hard to see because I apologize for it being a little bit pixelated today. But if we go on ahead and we look at this, right, not only are we seeing kind of the, the different colors, but do you see any motions that happen to be associated with with these patterns. Hmm. I'm going to actually see if I have another data set that highlights this a little bit better. But in the meantime, I want you to keep on looking and, and take a note. So you can still see it on the side as I go on ahead and I search for another, another option here. So see, I can switch the categories, which is really cool. All right. This one may show it a little bit better. All right, so 
unfortunately, I don't think I am seeing the data set that I am looking for. Depending upon what you have your SO, your science on a sphere um, on, so like for instance, mine's on an iPad at the moment, but if you happen to have it on uh, a computer or your iPhone, Sorry, folks, wrong one. Yeah, this one actually comes out really well. Um, but as I was saying, depending upon what you have your, what kind of device, you actually might have access to different play playlists. And so still trying to figure out here what all of our optimal playlists are, because some of them play out better on different devices. So, um, but here's a really good one. What do you think we might be looking at right here? If you can read the small print, extra points. But we are looking at sea surface currents right now and temperature. So it's kind of like the combination. It's looking at what we were looking at earlier, but in a different way, which is actually one of the really cool things that I really enjoy about this uh, science on sphere technology is that if you don't fully understand or it's not super obvious in one visual, then a lot of times there's other visuals that might help you understand better. And everyone's different. So it's kind of cool to be able to see this information differently. But so what do you notice right here? What do you think all of those swirly patterns are and all of that movement might be? Those are definitely the currents, right? And that coloration is still the same, a coloration that we saw earlier with that red being the, the warmer and the blue being the cooler. So now that we have a better view here, we can see all of those swirls and all of those currents. Now, if we look on the West Coast, do we have as strong swirls and currents? Not so much, right? So it's mainly on the East Coast, which really goes out to that question of like, well, why is it that we're seeing so much warmer waters, right? And what we have here is something called the Gulf Stream. So it's warmer water that's coming from the equator and it's being moved around. And the stronger and more defined the images are, so like in this case, it looks like one really big thick line, right? That means the stronger the currents are that we're seeing right here. If it's more like wispy, like on this side, that means that the currents aren't as strong. So here we're seeing really strong currents and here we see the changes, the changes in our, in our seasons, right? So it's a little bit starting to cool down a little bit, but all of these currents are still quite strong. Now, something else you may take note of is, well, do the currents maybe either go stronger or less strong depending upon the temperature of the water too, right? But staying pretty, pretty strong all throughout. Now there are these almost like donuts or rosettes or, um, or little circles that you're seeing right here. And any thoughts to what those might be? Hmm. Well, they're also where currents kind of move around in little eddies is what we like to call them. And so there are spots where the water will move easily, right, all throughout this area right here. But then sometimes they'll move along through some eddies and they'll keep on going and move along again. And so here we're seeing that pattern very distinct within our East Coast side right here, which is kind of cool. So if you're curious and maybe you're from a different part I'm gonna, of the world, I'm gonna go on ahead and I'm just gonna give this one big circle, a one big move along so we can get a chance to see what currents are like around the rest of the world. And feel free to chime in too if there's something that you notice that you find really interesting. All right, so here we're gonna start out with our Northern Hemisphere right here. And if I'm gonna, I'm gonna move down our Earth and we can see even more so now so now we're seeing a lot of the currents that are located right at our equator line, which is kind of neat. All right, now we're gonna get inside our virtual satellite plane. <laughs> Guess that'd be a spaceship, huh? And then we're going to move along. Now, as you can see, right, since we're focusing on currents, all of our continents are all blacked out, right? So that really helps us to be able to focus in on the water and not on land itself. Whoa! Check that out in Africa. Those currents are pretty incredible, right? So up in our northern hemisphere, we're seeing all of these little wisps, like all these small currents, right? And all of these little eddies here and there. Well, what about down below right here? Are we seeing many of those? Hmm. Not as much, right? So we're seeing maybe some stronger currents that are moving along. 
All right, we're continuing our world tour. Look at us go. This almost could be like an art project. It's so beautiful. All right, there we go. So we're seeing a little bit of Asia now. And then we're moving over. We're slowly getting to bottom of Australia, Indonesia, New Zealand. There you go. Right. And here we are back up towards Korea and Japan, Russia. And then back on over to the United States. Whoops. We're kind of, whoop, there we go. Aha, there we are. All right, set us back. So, that was kind of fun being able to travel the world and check out all those ocean currents. Who needs to be in a plane right now anyways when you have science on the sphere? That's right. <laughs> but it looks like Valeria is asking, does temperature change, oh, does temperature change due to Earth's rotation? That is a good question. Um, and so as the Earth rotates, I'm not sure if you're asking about ocean temperature or land temperature, but believe it or not, the rotation of the Earth does have a lot to do with weather. Yeah, absolutely. So in a way, yeah, it definitely affects temperature. Now, as our Earth rotates, right, it's moving along, it's, it's on an axis, what ends up happening is that um, the wind is, is, um, is being pulled in a certain direction. So I'm going to head on back to our SOS right here. Um, and I'm going to have us take a look. I'm going to try to rotate our Earth in a little bit of a different way. Now, here we might get a chance to see, and it's really, it's kind of tricky to see. But basically, if you are in the northern hemisphere, as it rotates, the winds basically, let's see if I can do this right on the screen, push this way. And as it pushes this way, it eventually moves upwards and then goes back around hits our west coast, and then goes down. So it makes this sort of motion all on our northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, it's actually the complete opposite. We can see that a little bit within the currents, though currents um, can be kind of tricky because it also depends on the depth of the ocean too. But basically, the wind moves our water and creates all of these different oceanic patterns in our ocean. So it creates um, some of the gyres too, but a lot of that has to also do with the temperatures in our ocean. So hot and warm temperatures are constantly exchanging to be able to create these currents. But so it's a lot of different factors. It's wind, it's the spin of the earth, it's the temperature, um, it's the topography, right? The, the basic bottom of the ocean and the bathymetry. So basically looking at, are there mountains underneath the water? Are there valleys underneath on the seafloor? lots of different ways. And so um, I think I may have a data set that will help show some of that wind direction. So let's go on ahead and find that together. All right, so gonna back on over. And this is actually kind of fun because this allows you to be able to, to see and kind of um, play along with that. So let's see, I think it starts with a G. Let's see, ah, here we go. Oh, nope, that was the wrong one. Next one. See, being looking at this data, you also have to be a very patient scientist. All right, so here we go. Ah, this is awesome. Thank you to James for pointing this one out to me. He's a science on a sphere whiz. All right, so here, I'll just give you actually a minute. Tell me what you notice. Not that I can hear you. I kind of can if you go on ahead and text us in to 562-286-1838. Always appreciate your participation. Wow, it's really going. Hmm. So here we're seeing a lot of the wind and all of its movements. And right now we're focused on the northern hemisphere. But remember, we kind of talked about the differences between northern hemisphere and southern a little bit. So... Let's see what you notice if we move it down here. Hmm. Well, here we're seeing very distinct wind patterns, right? So these wind patterns 
are helping to distribute the weather. Here we're seeing a lot. And two, if you notice, I almost feel like a weather person. Uh, if we go on ahead and notice, we are seeing all of these winds and all these clouds. And see how they're carrying, if we're going back to that Gulf Stream again, we are seeing a lot of those winds basically push up against the East Coast and, and move along. It's a little tricky to see. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on the East Coast here. And I'm gonna, ooh, that's blowing it up a little bit too large. There we go. Now this is a time lapse, right? So it's in some parts it's stronger, uh, other parts it's weaker. But here we're getting a chance to really see how a lot of this wind blows up the coastline here. And so what we have is what we actually call a lot of um, downwelling where from the east coast that wind is pushing the water up and out towards oops the wrong direction other way out right here and it pushes it out into the ocean now off of our coast we're seeing that wind push directly onto our coast right it looks like it's almost like there's a storm coming right on in and what we have off the west coast is considered downwelling and so what that is, is we have water that's being pushed along with the wind and it's coming towards our coastline and then um Oh, I'm sorry, we have upwelling, so it goes up against our coastline and we have water that comes up from the bottom and we're able to get a lot of nutrients that come from the deep. And that's part of the reason why we have so many fish and other marine life uh, that makes our water kind of cloudy here. And so that's because of all the wonderful nutrients that are coming up from the deep. But if we look here on our east coast, we have lots of winds and lots of currents that are bringing all of that Gulf Stream water, that warm water that we saw earlier, up along our coastline here. So hopefully, Valeria, that answered your question a little bit. But it's very complicated. A lot of different factors that are involved. But I love how you're also thinking about the, the rotation of the Earth because that is a very important piece. Awesome. Uh, awesome. And it looks like you had a chance, Valeria, to observe the wind currents, which is great. Awesome. All right. So now... A lot of this temperature and the wind, right, we briefly touched upon the nutrients too because we have nutrients coming up from the bottom and that allows a lot of ocean life to be around. Well, scientists are able to check that out too. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at another data set. More fun colors. Oh, actually, you know what, friends? Our time is up. My goodness. That just, that just blew my mind. I can't believe it. Well, friends, there are way more data sets. I'm very excited to hopefully delve a little bit deeper in with all of you today. As you can see, there's a ton, and we're going to look at marine chlorophyll and land vegetation. Um, and so that was going to help us look at all the different kinds of what we like to call productivity. So basically, all the sorts of stuff that's growing, right? So for instance, in our ocean, it's going to be a lot of algae and a lot of phytoplankton, that small microscopic stuff. That basically is the base of the entire food web, right? So we can use satellites and look at different kinds of imagery to paint our world in so many different pictures, right? Like here's just a little snippet of all the different ways in which we can picture our Earth. One of my favorites is actually the species richness, which I was hoping we'd get to. But we had a lot of great questions, and I definitely appreciate your participation. And I love that we had a chance to just focus in on wind and the Earth rotation. I mean, it's very unlike a lot of our classes. So thank you so very much for joining us today. There is a really exciting activity for all of you youth scientists, and one that, who knows, I may just do myself because it sounds really cool. It's a nature bingo. So, I mean, the prize is a nice pat on the back or maybe you get yourself an ice cream, right? Uh, but it's really fun and it's a nice way to be able to just get outside and explore your own backyard. So, you know, do you find, have were you able to find an animal that you've never seen before? Are you able to find a really cool plant in your neighborhood? Um, can you find an animal that only has two legs, right? So there's lots of different ways that you can explore your neighborhood and maybe get yourself a bingo in, in the process and feel good about winning that, that round of bingo against yourself. Or maybe you have another friend or maybe you're playing against your cat that you decide to take out with you because... You know, you have lots of friends that are hanging out. Anyways, all right, friends. So once again, youth scientists, thanks again for joining us today. Always a pleasure having you. Now, tomorrow is really exciting because we're going to be focusing on scuba diving. Yeah. So if you've ever been curious of what it's like to be a scuba diver, or maybe you're a diver yourself, or maybe even, you know, you're interested in becoming a diver, this is going to be a really cool class. Or maybe if you're not into it, you'd be like, I don't even 
really understand what that world is like, this is going to be a very fun program. And we're going to talk all about the underwater world of literally like being under underneath it and experiencing it ourselves through our eyes. So feel free to join us then, you scientists. And until then, have a great rest of your day. And once again, feel free to send in any questions that you might have at live at lbaop.org. And we'll catch you tomorrow. Take care. Bye, everyone.